He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save. Neither is it ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, and he will not hear. Good morning. Good morning. Your sin has separated you and God. Your choices are wrong. I've kept him from here. Oh, God's hand's not short that he can't save, that he can't do good, that he can't help. All those things are not happening because it's our fault. You know, we talked in Sunday school class this morning about the stiff neck and the hard hearted. That's a problem that's going back since the beginning of the time. I'll do it my way. I'll do it the way Daddy and Grandma said. But the Bible says, well, I don't care. I'll do it my way. And the way I was raised to believe, or the way the preacher, or the Pope, or this or that or the other says, I'll do it that way. Makes you stiff neck. And I was talking, you know, if you're, if you're going down a road, the window down, 40 degrees outside, and that wind's coming through, hitting your neck, and next morning, how do you wake up? I do, I wake up stiff neck. And if you're stiff neck, tell me what that does to the whole body. Somebody hollers over and says, hey, Brent, I'm stiff neck. I can't turn, so what does my whole body turn? But, but we're stiff neck spiritually, it turns the whole body wrong. Stiffens the whole body up. A lot of talking in the Bible about the hard hearted and the stiff that God's Word has given us powerful advice and tools and truths all through it. From the beginning to the end. And this morning I'm going to talk about coming over a huge cow. Huge. A challenge we must overcome. A challenge we must win. And that is temptation. The challenge of temptation. Temptation is no respecter of persons. You know that, don't you? It don't hit some and leave others alone. Even those that appear to be the most righteous, they suffer temptations. Even the people that would be closest to the Lord suffer temptations. Nobody can escape its draw, for we are all tempted to sin. Tempted to do wrong. <coughs> Anybody that ever says I'm never tempted to liar? Draws <coughs> tempted. Even Jesus, the Son of God, was tempted. Not out of his lust or wrong, but because that old tempter came to try and destroy him. I wonder how many people in this room have ever been tempted to sin. Anybody in here ever been tempted to sin? I'm running by all of you shaking your head. I even saw one or two with a gumption to raise your hand. <laughs> Good, because if you said you didn't do nothing, you'd be a liar. Because every single one of us is tempted to sin. Tempted to do wrong. Now, next question. How many have ever given in to the temptation to sin here today? Every one of you ought to raise your hand on that. Because we have. We have been tempted and given in to that temptation to sin. Temptation's real. It's here amongst us today. It'll be in our homes when we get home. It'll be in our jobs tomorrow, our retirement world tomorrow. Temptation is real. And it's not going away. It's not going to get any easier. James, the first chapter, verse 13. Read this with me. James 1. Actually, I'll go back to about verse 
12, James 1, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Not gives in to them, not cusses and stops and gets angry about them. But the one that endures. The one that if you will fight through temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life. Which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man with evil deeds and things and lusts and desires. That's not of God. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Is it not amazing what some men's lusts are? Crazy things come into the hearts and minds of men. He says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth it bring forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Now go back into verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted of God. Did you catch that? He didn't say, if you be tempted. He said, what? When? when? Meaning we're all tempted. And it's going to happen. And it's going to happen time and time and time and time again. And sometimes that's many times a day. Sometimes it can be an hour worth of temptation. It's not if you're tempted, it's when you're tempted. Jesus even warned us that in this world you're going to have trouble. You see trouble in this country today? Amen. You see trouble in this world today? You see what can very easily be a destructive time for Christians in this country today? I do. Don't act shocked. People come, I can't believe this. And I can't believe that. Well, you need to. This ain't the first time we've seen such godlessness in this world as we see today. It ain't the first time by any stretch. Jesus said in this world you will have trouble. Because men are tempted to sin out of evil hearts and minds. Listen, in this world you're always going to face temptation. And temptation has been man's greatest challenge since the beginning of time. Our greatest challenge is not overcoming uh, our need for fossil fuels. Our challenge isn't to build more roads or to improve our bridges. That isn't our greatest challenge that mankind faces. And listen, believe it or not, the greatest <laughs> challenge is not global warming. Okay, it's not gas from cows polluted the earth. Our greatest challenge that all mankind faces, including every single Christian, is temptation. Temptation, and it comes in so many various ways. It's, one thing. it's mind blowing to me. How the things that pleases people differ from person to person to person. One person, it can be a strange man or a strange woman. That's what they want. Another is enticed by money. Another is by faith. Another is by coming into the Lord's house and trying to mess up and to, you know, to destroy the service and the worship of the Christian. The list goes on and on and on. But from the beginning, we see temptation... In the Garden of Eden, Satan, in the form of a serpent, whispers lies into the ears of Eve. He tempts her with a piece of fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that she was not to partake of. He tempts her. And the woman turns around, and out of lust and desire, it says she sees the fruit as enticing Mmm, delicious, good for food. <clears throat> they will lie to them about God, about who God is. 
the devil had lied in that garden about what God said. And he used the lust of the eyes to turn Eve and then Adam. She took it, she ate. Genesis 3, 6 says, and she gave some to her husband. <coughs> All because she fell. And he fell to temptation. It's always been here and it's not going anywhere. It is the greatest fight that you and I fight today. It is the greatest fight that mankind has ever fought. You know why? Because when you give in to temptation, the consequences are deadly. It's deadly for your soul. It's deadly for eternity because those that leave none prepared and lost for eternity experience the second death when you give in to temptation. The consequences are deadly. Man's been facing temptation ever since the garden. It is everybody's battle. You know, right after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit descended upon him. What happened right after that? Right after that, what happened? Led into the wilderness. Forty days of what? Temptation. Even Jesus, the Son of God, being human, could not escape temptation. However, Jesus did what most Christians don't. He stood his ground. Through and by the Word of God, he did not give in. He did not listen to the lies of Satan. He combated him with the Word of God. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 16, says that we have a great high priest. Jesus, the Son of God, is our high priest. We don't need man to go between us and God because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because we were buried in baptism for the forgiveness of our sin, we have Jesus sitting on the right hand of God, and He is there for us. I need no man between me and God. God made it that way. The old priests of the Old Testament are done with, they're gone. We have, listen, a high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Listen now. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the field of our infirmities. Otherwise, we don't have a high priest sitting on the right hand of God that doesn't understand what we struggle with day to day. Because Jesus struggled. He struggled through it. He understands our infirmities and was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Did you hear that? You can't ever say, oh, nobody understands my temptation. Nobody's been where I am to want to sin and to have to fight. Well, the Hebrew writer says, in all points, for 40 days, and in his life, Satan tempted him to do wrong. But it says he did it and survived it without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the help and to help in the time of need. Where are we to go when we're praying and we need to talk to God and we need forgiveness and we need help? And uh, we need the strength. Where do we go? We go to the throne of God. Not the throne of any man here. Not a government. Not anybody. We go to God through Jesus Christ that sits on His right hand that is there telling God, I know what they're going through. I've been there. And working, if you will, as an attorney on our behalf. He is our high priest. And he's been through it. And he sticks up for us when his Christians are truly repentant because he understands that temptation is real. Do you understand James says God cannot be tempted? Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Now you know why Jesus is on the right hand. He experienced it. He knows it. That's the reason he speaks to God on our behalf. God can't be tempted. 
but yet Jesus in every single way he was. And he knows the temptation is real. And listen, while we're here, temptation ain't going away. You might as well forget that out of your head. Well, maybe, you know, you think, well, I've been tempted to this. When I reach 30, I won't suffer that day. When I reach 35, when I reach 50, when I reach 60, when I reach 92 like Laverne, I won't get that all these good things. Amen. Y'all ever felt that way before? What tempts me now? You know, I'm going to struggle with that later. Did the temptations ever go, did the struggle ever end? don't ever end. The fight's always there. It never stops. Even with the things that are not sin that we don't have and we can't grasp or we really have a desire for, though they may not be sin in themselves, the fact that we want them so bad and we'll suffer, we'll commit things and do things wrong to have those things makes those things sin. Does that make sense? I hope it does because it's true. Nobody knows you like the devil does. Now, we might not be able to avoid temptation, but we can overcome it. We can overcome temptation. There is a promise in the Bible. It's made from God to every Christian. Made, to, made from God to every Christian. Made from God to every born again child of God. There's a promise in the Bible. First Corinthians, the tenth chapter. You want to turn down to First Corinthians, the tenth chapter? You can read with me. This is uh, after that uh, Paul had reminded the Corinth church how the nation of Israel did not stand in the wilderness. They did not stand against temptation in the wilderness. They gave in to temptation in the wilderness. Idolatry, sexual immorality, idol worship, grumbling. That resulted in a judgment of 23,000 dropping dead in one day. 23,000 dropping dead in one day. And Paul is pointing back and he's talking about all of that. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, uh, verse, let's look at verse 8. What would you say to verse 8? Let me flip back one. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. Now some, it says, you think, well, fornication, some must have been probably two or three people. There are probably ten out of that bunch there and commit fornication. Mm. How many did it say go on and read? How many dropped dead one day? 23,000! 23,000! That's a lot of fornicating! <laughs> Neither, he said, let us tempt Christ. As some of those tempted, they were destroyed as serpents. Do not murmur like some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. All these things happened to them for our examples. Examples to us. For upon the ends of the world are come. Temptation ain't going anywhere. If we're tempted, if we've got a weak sexual stance, we're, we're tempted for, to commit sexual sin. If we've got a low opinion of ourselves, we're tempted to lie, tempted to cheat. If we think we're better than what we really are, we're tempted to murmur and to complain that life ain't as good as it should be for somebody like me that deserves it. Oh, all of us are tempted. All of us are tempted. They ain't going away. We can overcome it. James, the fourth chapter tells us how. Resist the devil and what? He will flee from you. Is that what it said? He'll never come back? Is that what it said? No. He'll flee from you. Resist. But the stiff neck and the uncircumcised of heart, they won't resist. Because they're selfish. It's all about them, their desires, their happiness. 
They don't repent. They don't change. They don't resist. And there are really a lot of good reasons for resisting temptation. But the greatest reason to, tempt his, tempt, to resist temptation is because it causes you to sin, and sin really does matter. Amen. Sin is an important problem that needs to be addressed by Christians today. Sin does matter. I, I, I've got a feeling that many people become Christians and they think, well, now that I'm a Christian and I've been saved, my sin ain't as bad as everybody else's sin. Sin's a problem. That's why temptation and the resisting of it is so, so important. It's a big deal. But the question is, do you think your sin is a big deal? Think about it. Your sin. What you do or don't do that you know is wrong. Think. Is that really a big deal to you? It needs to be. But I dare say, with a good number of us sitting here today, that our sin ain't as big a sin in our minds as it really is. Because people have got worse problems than we do. Their sins are worse than our sins. When really our sins will send us straight to hell. Just like the sins of anybody else. Sin's a big deal. Sin, understand, was the reason that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, was nailed to a cross because of sin. It's the reason He was beaten. It's the reason He was bruised. It's the reason He was broken down and left hanging on a cruel, rugged cross was because of sin. Sin's a big deal. And when we do what the Bible says don't do, and when we don't do what the Bible says for us to do, we sin and it's big. Because <coughs> they'll take you to hell. So the Bible says to raise your children, in the way of the Lord. And you don't do that. To know to do good and to do it not, James says, is what? It's oh, but my sin and as big a deal as her sin. When we don't do what we know we're to do as a Christian, mother, father, husband, wife, neighbor, brother and sister in Christ when we don't do we know it's wrong but we stick in that neck don't we to the point that we turn the whole body to wrong and sin and against God because we've not been obedient to his word sin separates us from God I can't think of anything worse than that can you is any sin that you can think of Think of your own weakness at this time. Is any sin truly worth you being separated from God here and then for eternity in hell? Any sin, is it worth it? Then you've got to resist temptation. You've got to resist the devil. You've got to fight him with the Word of God and being obedient to what it says or he is going to destroy you, I promise. talked in Sunday school about him asking them to turn, not be stiff-necked, not be hard-hearted, and to escape the fierceness of the wrath of God. You know what it says? It says, they would not listen. They did not hear. They would not change. They would not repent because what they wanted, they felt they deserved. Well, I'm here to tell you, they got what they deserved because they were stiff-necked and hard-hearted and that was the fierceness of the wrath of God I just can't think of anything anything worth our separation from God sin's a big deal real quickly there's a couple of ways I want to tell you about taking down temptation know your enemy you're going to overcome and take down temptation. Know your enemy. 
Everybody says, well, that's the devil. It is. But we talked in Sunday school class, and everybody answered it correctly. I said, in the physical world that we live in, not spiritual, who is your worst enemy? Yourself. you got to know yourself. The devil does. The devil knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He's been watching ever since you was born. He knows you. He knows your weaknesses. you got weaknesses he knows about you that never even dreamed you had. You better know yourself. And when you find out you're wrong somewhere, don't resist repenting and changing. When you resist repenting and changing, you follow your daddy the devil. And you're stiff-necked. And you're hard-hearted. And you're separated from God. Satan, he is your enemy. But remember this. He's bigger than you. He's tougher than you. He's a lot smarter than you. <coughs> the only power we have over him is by our help from our high priest in heaven to reject him and resist him. For that he has no control. With that's the Christian's attitude, he has no option. But he does not quit. He wants to win the battle. He wants to separate you from God. Here, because if he separated you from God here through sin and enticement and lust, then he separated you from God for eternity. And it's over. It's a battle to him. He hates God that bad. That he hates you that bad. It's scary. To think that the devil's been watching us for so long. But Peter describes him as a roaring what? Wow. Lion. Seeking who he what? Wow. Okay, y'all watch Animal Planet and Animal Channels and this, that, and the other. You don't ever see a lion just walking beside a wilderness and jumping over on a dude. No, it's lurking, right? Watch it, right? Moving slow and quiet until it's ready to pounce. Is that the way a lion does? That's the way Satan does. Oh, he's watching. He's waiting for that little wildebeest to start limping. <coughs> so he can destroy you. But we have ammunition against this lion. We have ammunition against this enemy. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ. When we repent and we're baptized to be saved, the Lord denies us to the church means we then have a high priest on the right hand of God to go to bat for us when times are weak, when we mess up, and when we need strength to overcome. It all starts with the blood of Jesus Christ. That is our ammunition. And it's given to us when we repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. That blood is applied and it is there till the day we die as long as we live faithful unto Him and not live a life of giving into temptation. Committing sin that will eventually even separate the Christian from God. Sin's a big deal. We start with temptation to overcome it. We start in the watery grave of baptism, meeting the blood of Jesus Christ. To overcome it means we remain faithful to His Word, not stiffening our necks and bowing up against Him, but being faithful and following every word given from heaven above that we read in the New Testament Scriptures today. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. First verse for invitation hymn. If you're not a Christian, if you've not had the blood of Jesus Christ applied in baptism, immersion, a watery grave, if you've not met the blood of Jesus Christ the way the Bible says it, we want you to come today because you ain't got a shot of heaven if you have <laughs> But if you haven't done so and you've fallen away, you need help. You need prayer. Come. So I was a born again Christian, but I've given in time and time again, and I need prayer and I need help. Hey, it's your destroy, it's your choice. Having a stiff neck, that's your choice. <laughs> Loving one another. That's your choice. Obeying the Word of God is your choice. 
being saved the way God's Word says, I ain't mom and daddy's choice. Don't care how mad it might make him when they hear you follow the Word of God. That don't matter. Being saved is your choice. You answer for that for eternity. Just like you answer for your reply to temptation. How do you respond? It's up to you, ain't it? Let's let us sing a hymn of invitation first of all.